David, hi. Mtune, uh, hi, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, Andy. Fine, thanks. How is the um, how is the proposal coming along? Fine, thank you, Sandra. So far, so good. Okay. So I'm hoping. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest is uh, maybe after after this session, we can we can have a quick chat. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on on the class and to find out if there are going to be any. Um, any issues or challenges that you will experience. Uh, so now at, at the beginning, I mean, at the beginning, it, um, a lot of things are probably going to appear strange, right? But uh, eventually, I think you should be able to get used to what's happening. So it's just a matter of time. I, th I think I foresee a situation where you should be able to pick up um, to pick up on the, the language and, and the tools and the technology that you need to be using. Um, by the time we get to week number number three or four, actually, which is good. Uh, so it's a good thing that you, you're joining this class, actually, when we haven't covered a significant amount of content. So, yeah. Have you managed to, how far have you gone with the reading? We are looking at related way. Yeah, how far have you read? Have you read that uh, introductory piece, the learning from data part? Data mining. Yes. Yeah, I've done it. Okay, so you understand what uh, what the difference is between supervised learning, uh, uh, supervised learning, reinforcement learning. Yeah, I'm beginning to get the picture. Okay. Yes, now we are beginning to get the concept. And uh, slowly and slowly we are getting there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't know about the solid part here. I mean, there's little time here. I want to make sure this is uh, quickly done, right? I need to converge quickly. Did you manage to install the... Uh, have you managed to, to familiarize yourselves with uh, Google Colab? Did you manage to install Jupyter Notebook, Python? Hello? Oh, Python, I, I, I'm looking for the ID. I was trying to download the yes. Mm, okay. I see. I see. All right, so we're just going to wait for a short while. I see one uh, one person just joined us, Muimba. Um, so we'll, we'll wait just for a few more minutes. And once uh, <clears throat> once we have at least five five individuals from class, then we should be able to start. Muimba, hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Doc. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Um, I noticed you attended, um, you attended the machine learning talk by, by the guys from, um, is it uh, Public Health or something? Yeah? I hope you yeah. enjoyed it. Yes, it was quite interesting, Doc.
So I, I, I don't know, I, I'm looking at the time and I, I suppose uh, I suppose we can start. Uh, I think we have... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, we only have three people, right? So <clears throat> it's almost 1740, so I, I guess I'm just going to assume that the others are, are joining us later. So uh, we can start then, I guess. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, just to, to ask if you could maybe confirm if you can hear me and if you can see my screen also. Uh, yes, we can see, but not very busy. So, sorry, you can't, but not what? We can see, but. Very, it's not very like visible. The screen is on. Oh, now we can. Oh, okay. I was saying you can't. It's visible, sir. You can't All right. see it. All right, thanks. All right. Uh, so I suppose we can start it. So I just wanted to uh, start off by saying just uh, to mention to uh, the colleagues that I know in this course. So I'm, I'm working with uh, with a group of final year students. Um, they're in fourth year, they're um, hopefully graduating uh, next year or something. Um, and so the, the problem that they're exploring involves a bit of machine learning. And, and unfortunately, so the program that they're pursuing doesn't introduce them to, to uh, key concepts of machine learning. Also. So normally what I do is I, uh, if, I, if I'm working with a group of students that, 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 that are working on an area that's related to either information retrieval or machine learning, then I'll invite them to attend the first couple of classes just so they can get started. So you will see very strange names like uh, uh, Python, Ivy, uh, Danny, and Tune, I think uh, including uh, David as well. <coughs> they will vanish very, very soon. All right, uh, I, I thought would, uh, I, I don't know, start by just asking if people have Questions with, with with regards to what we looked at. Yes, Google Colab or Jupyter Notebook, or perhaps if you you decided to um, explore Jupyter Lab also. I think there was a question from from Derek about it should be Derek. I think about differences between Jupyter uh, Jupyter Notebook, uh, a classic version, and Jupyter Lab. And, and I did highlight the fact that uh, Jupyter Lab um, enables you to so sort of like extend the functionality that you wouldn't otherwise uh, have available in Jupyter Notebook. So it's the same thing, the idea is the same. I mean, setting the interface is slightly different, um, but, um, but the idea is the same anyway. So I guess this is it, hopefully. All right. Um, I wanted to start off uh, by saying that, uh, so two things, right? The first thing is uh, I had, we had planned that there would be a trial, a trial talk. I'm thinking that we can pause and finish this hands-on session first, and then possibly have the trial talk. If we manage to finish uh, lecture series number two today, we can have the trial talk next week where I'll, I'll, I'll do the talk. Um, or perhaps after next week, once we go through the, the crisp DM model, because it turns out that I think that the, the talk is going to make a lot more sense once we, we have a comprehensive understanding of the different phases associated with the crisp DM model. And that's my thinking. So we're gonna pause, for, we're gonna pause and wait until we are, we've gotten to that stage, hopefully next week or week after next. Um, but I, I wanted to find out if, uh, if if people manage to go through this paper and if they have any comments or thoughts about, about the paper. I mean, using Kishev's uh, is a three-pass three process, were we able to make sense out of what was going on or maybe there were certain areas that were a bit unclear? And, and a reminder that part of, part of the reason why we we were doing this is so we, 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 we can familiarize ourselves with, uh, with the grading, right? 
so I was hoping people would, uh, would have questions about the grading process after going through the paper itself. I don't know if people managed to go through the paper. Yes, do you, do you want to share your thoughts here, Sin? I mean, uh, maybe thoughts on, on I, I don't know, what, were you able to understand what exactly was done and the approach and the problem that was being addressed or something? Or is there anything? Yeah, there anything? Uh, yeah I kind of understood what, what was happening. Um, just uh, the interpretation of the results that's when uh, that's where uh, I just need to do a bit of more reading. But basically, the idea was um, so um, these there's these outputs that uh, masters and uh, PhD students uh, come up with, which are known as dissertations and theses. So um, normally, it's somebody that's uh so depending on which institution it is so certain institutions have um uh, have a way in which uh they kind of um classify them so when we say classify is then uh categorize them to be either a thesis that belongs to so remember when these uh dissertations or theses are submitted um they come in bulk so one wouldn't know that this is an engineering one. Like this comes from the faculty of natural sciences, for instance, uh, the, the faculty of education, um, veterinary or, or whatever. So there are about two, from the paper, there are about two ways in which that is done. So um, there's one which uh, the institution uses um like university of zambia for instance uh, they use some people to uh to do that the classification and the other one is um uh, i've just forgotten how the other one is done but well university of zambia uses people to do that which could be somewhat um which the, which can result to some misclassification because they might not correctly classify uh, uh, to which category the, 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 the dissertation belongs to. So uh, in the study, basically, um, the data was, uh, data was being harvested and using uh, the page numbers, using the title and using the abstract that information was used now to classify. So classification was done in th uh, at three layers. So there was, um, there, was, um, there was the collection, there was the subject, and uh, I've just forgotten the other one. I, I just have to refer to my notes because right now I'm coming from work going home. So I, most of the things I'm, I'm saying are just uh, from the back of my mind. So that's what the, the, the research was basically aiming towards and um yeah so the findings were kind of interesting because well in in uh, when i think is it is the is it by by subject so you find that, that uh two features were used so they were using um page, page numbers and the text so one would expect that if you use text as a feature it would produce better results compared to the page numbers, but that was, but the case was the opposite. So you find that uh, the page numbers predicted were predicted accurate results, more accurate results compared to page numbers uh, to to the to the text to the to the title of of the thesis or dissertation. And well, the, the reason was that. Um, uh, some some text was lost during the process of you know extracting the text from the text from the pdf document and then um uh using that text now for 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 machine learning so those were some of the insights that i got from but but for much information i, I have to refer to to my notes all right uh, thanks i mean that's quite uh i think it, 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 it's actually it's actually a good summary of what exactly was done uh, 
I'm, I'm glad you, it's, it's clear, you probably read the entire thing, I think, which is a good thing. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? Uh, uh, did anyone else manage to get on your page number 17? 17, which is interesting. So when, when you're seeing was as, as people are thinking about some of the comments they might have, it could, it could be, you know, a comment uh, about an interesting aspect of what you read or something maybe that was unclear. Uh, if you manage to read this, it'd be nice if you could share your thoughts. But to sum it all, right, what, 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 um, what Yasin was saying was that uh, idea, this idea of thesis and dissertations, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's commonplace in most uh, higher education institutions. So typically, an institution like Unza, for instance, or CBU, and I was trying to gain access to a, a CBU repository, but it's, it's not available here, they'll, they'll typically archive research content in, in, in a platform called an institution repository. So this would be output such as, um, you know, journal publications that are authored by, authored or co-authored by faculty staff, you know, conference, conference papers, things like technical reports. Um, um, everything is archived and the idea is you want to showcase to the outside world uh, what sort of research you conduct. It turns out that uh, if, if you look at most of these ranking entities, um, they tend to uh, look at these digital markers, right, to, to try and uh, uh, incorporate that particular aspect into their ranking algorithm tree. Um, so I was, I was opening up some, some sample repositories, so there's UNSA and then my alma mater also has a, a repository, right? What you notice is that the, the information here is organized in a certain way. Now, the interesting thing about these platforms is that uh, for a very long time, and I think this is still the case right now, the depositing of content into these platforms is, is usually done by a particular unit in the university. In the case of UNSA, the, now UNSA is a bit complex because it, the administration of the repository is done by CICT, right, which is like the IT department, it's a directorate at UNSA anyway. And then the, the actual, um, so the the day-to-day -day management, right, usage of the repositories overseen by the the library. Now within the library, uh, people that are in part hired to to actually ingest content into the repository. And unfortunately for Unza, right, uh, last time we checked, there were only two people that were doing this. Now, if you think about this for a second, uh, you, you realize that uh, that it, it's, that's that's not that's not sufficient. Right, for them to handle the amount of workload that comes through their way. Right, UNSA, to give you a bit of perspective, UNSA has a total of about, uh, close to about 900 faculty staff, right? Um, and I believe uh, in any given year, you probably have uh, anywhere be between, I don't know, 200 to 500, like, right? I'm just not sure about the exact number here, of students graduating. So the idea here is that every time somebody like Lighton publishes a paper like this, for instance, um, or a conference proceeding, for instance, or a technical report, which is usually the case when you are working with final year students, right? So if if uh, if the end result is is not good enough to be converted into um, a peer review publication, you convert it into a technical report. All those things are supposed to go into the repository, right? Including the dissertations and theses that are produced by postgraduate students. The problem here is that uh, it's just too much for two people to handle, right? Now, if you read through literature, you, you come across ideas or concepts to do with self-archiving. So the idea is simple. You can teach students and faculty staff to actually go to this platform, log in, and be able to deposit content on their own. But this has been an issue at UNSA, right? The library has, try, has tried to train people to be able to do this, but uh, with little success. Um, which is why, if you were to quickly uh, go through the dissertations, right, what you will notice is that there's a huge backlog, right? So if we were to, so I just went into the thesis and dissertation. If you go to the repository, right, the homepage here, you notice that it's organized, um, it's organized into what are called communities, right? So essentially, at a very high level, you can clearly see that each community corresponds to a school, for instance. So school of agri, school of education, engineering, um, you know, forget about examination past papers here, but school of humanities, 
we can clearly see that self-archiving is almost non-existent, right? If you look at engineering, there's no way, right? We can sit here and, and say that uh, the whole lot of engineering has only produced six publications, right? Since UNSA was opened, it's just not possible, right? So what we are seeing is a situation where there's a huge backlog. Now, the focus of this paper was on a particular type of content that is deposited into the repository, right? ETDs. Um, what we discovered after we, 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 um, we, we, we did a, um, a situation analysis was that um, there were issues associated with how the descriptive information about this information was tagged, right? Besides that, I mean, if you were to break down these publications by year, for instance, you'll notice that there's a bit of a mismatch here, right? Um, you can clearly see that uh, there, there are dissertations that are missing that were clearly generated uh, prior to somewhere around 2010 or something, right? So there's a backlog of legacy content and then uh, the recency of the content is a bit of a problem here. But besides that, the most serious issues are to do with the descriptive information itself. In an ideal case, when you have a dissertation like uh, this one that was authored by Michel Chigunta, for instance, if you open it up, one of the important pieces of information that you expect to see, right, the descriptive information is who supervised this person, right? Um, and because, because the library doesn't have the manpower, it's only two people that do this, what they do is they prioritize which metadata elements to associate to this content, right? So they'll sacrifice certain things here. Um, uh, aside from that, I mean, you can see obvious issues to do with, um, and I think this, this would be best explained if we look at uh, uh, a dissertation from computer science, for instance. So I'll go to School of Natural Sciences quickly. Try to give you a bit of perspective here. Uh, and if we can scroll down to this, there's a dissertation that I like using that was authored by Arinani. If only I can find it. There we go. Uh, if you look at this dissertation, right, what you will notice is if you look at things like the subjects, the, the, the subject, you notice that uh, this, this is not how you'd normally associate descriptive information or metadata to content from computer science, right? These are generic tags that have nothing to do with the computer science content here. It's almost like uh, this is being tagged as an agri-centric uh, dissertation, right? So uh, those among other things are the sort of problems that we notice. And so the thinking is that to, to try and work on the problem to do with the recency of content and to cut down on the uh, potential errors that are introduced because of human intervention, we can build these classification models, right? Classification models that will make it possible for some of these metadata elements to be automatically generated, right? And so the role of the human being essentially is just to verify what has been automatically generated by, by, by the models or the, by, by the, the, the algorithms, right? Now, you may not really appreciate the, um, um, I guess, the, the, the positive aspects of doing that, but to, to give you an idea here, a person from the library who manually has this information, before they actually deposit the content into this platform. What they have to do is they have to open up this document, right? Read the abstract, the entire abstract, read the title, and then use the information, right? That I've acquired after reading the, uh, the title and the abstract to determine what sort of subjects they should associate to this dissertation, among other things, right? And, and some, some studies that we've conducted have actually uh, yielded interesting results like uh, it can take anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes, right, for this person to actually create metadata and deposit the content into the repository. And in fact, if you go through the workflow, the, the ingestion workflow, it's a five-step process that is quite lengthy. Um, so the paper is essentially just centered around how we can automate some of the processes uh, to reduce on the number of errors and to improve on you know, the problem to do with recent of content, ideally. Now, the, the part that uh, Yasin was talking about uh, to do with uh, you know, evaluation and whatnot, we, we, we will very soon understand what all these raw caves are all about, right? To we'll be able to interpret all these different things here. This is essentially what, what we're doing in this course, right? We'll be able to interpret uh, these confusion metrics like this so that you're 
be able to explain what these numbers mean, right? Um, I mean, there are obvious metrics that we have here, like precision, recall, and accuracy. I mean, if you've done an information retrieval course, it should be a bit intuitive, but if you haven't, um, it's also fine we'll be able to, to, um, to understand all of this. But the key thing here that will probably give you a bit of perspective of what was done here is the accuracy rate. So when we say that the classification of the automatic classification of uh, um, that the automatic classification using an ETD title page, for instance, results in an accuracy of 98.9%. We're saying there's a nine, almost one, there's a nine out of 10, almost 10 out of 10, but there's a nine out of 10% chance that the classification will give us a correct result, right? Um, but anyway, we, this, it turns out a lot of stuff that was covered in this paper will be used as, um, um, will be used as examples going forward, so, which is why I thought it would be nice for us to introduce this, this thing from, um, from the outset, really. Uh, any, any thoughts before we continue or comments? Uh, yes, just one. Yes. Um, I think maybe one thing that uh, I think caught my attention when reading this paper is that um, I think the issue that came up, this uh, automation of classification of digital objects is that uh, it's also an issue that I noticed um, when I was with the judiciary that it's also a problem they are also trying to solve um, with regards to judgments. Uh, legal documents, right? Yes, they've been trying to see how they can uh, have a short summary of uh, the, the judgment that is produced. And they did, uh, they, they actually wanted to develop an information system where one can search and then quickly see a summary of a judgment. Their main issue is that they needed uh, a legal person to be sitting and summarizing all these uh, legal documents. That was the other challenge. Yeah, um, I mean, how, how practical is that, right? I mean, I, I read about all these funny court cases here, and I see some images of uh, people coming out of court, and I'm sure there are so many documents, right? The question is how many people do you have to implore, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Now, what, what, you're, what you're talking about is, uh, Francis, is what they call uh, automatic summarization, right? It's a well-known problem. The interesting thing about most of the stuff we're, we're discussing in this course field is there are known solutions. The issue is appropriating those solutions to suit your context, right? Um, uh, how long did you work for the judiciary, by the way? Uh, just over two years. Okay. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, and it turns out that the number of actually studies that have been conducted on legal documents, right? It's a, so legal document, health information, for instance. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting problem, right? It's an interesting, so, so the, the issue is uh, if you, if you, the best way of thinking about this is imagine a dissertation like the one that Alinani authored, right? This is about 4,000 pages. The question to ask, similar to what you're explaining is, can we provide, by, read, by, by reading through this document, right, can we provide a good enough summary that somebody can use to understand what was done in the study, yeah. right? Um, it's an interesting problem, but it's, it's possible, it's doable actually. Uh, maybe we can include a, a, a paper that looks at legal documents as, as we are reading these papers. I'll put a note on that thing as we have an expert there. Um, any other thoughts? There's an interesting study. Uh, I, I sat in on a talk uh, when I was attending the um, ATD 2019 symposium, really interesting talk where these people are using deep learning uh, techniques to provide or try and generate, or to, or to automatically generate summaries of uh, chapters in dissertations and theses. Right, so a document like this one that was authored by Alinani, the question is, can we, can we generate a summary of chapter two, a summary of chapter four, a summary of chapter five, All right? Um, uh, if you sit down and think about it, you realize that there are countless, countless um, 
places where that can be applied. I always like using Zambia as an example. If you look at mainstream media, print media like Daily Mail, these people rarely report on the interesting research that is done in places like UNSA, CPU, Mungushi University, Lusaka University. Believe it or not, there's interesting work that people do, right? And the, 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 the reason is simple, right? Very few people would be willing to sit down and read a 4,000 page, 4,000 uh, word long document so that they can, they, can, they can get like a summarized version that is easier to digest by, by your average person out there. You know? So interesting stuff going, going on out there. Um, any other thoughts? I do hope as we were reading this, we, at the back of our minds, we, uh, we are thinking about uh, this distribution here, right? Uh, because it turns out that uh, assignment number one is going to be, uh, is essentially going to be, I hope we are thinking about this, right? From 5%, 10% and all these things here. All right, um, if there are no other, uh, contributions or complaints or questions, then maybe we can proceed, I guess. Okay. Just scroll down to... So we got to a stage last week where we uh, were familiarizing ourselves with Google Colab and, uh, and Jupyter Notebook. Um, uh, sorry to take you back. No, it's fine, yes. Um, there on the distribution, I just wanted to fully uh, understand what uh, uh, the, the section for argument. Oh, uh, so, so, so the, the idea of a literature review is it's, it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be a data dump, right? Most people make the mistake of just summarizing the paper without uh, presenting arguments, right? No paper is perfect. So when I shared this paper here, I, one of the things we, we, we were expecting you to do is to criticize the paper because it's not perfect, right? In as much as it went through a rigorous peer review process, right? There a lot of useful, and there was a lot of useful feedback that came away from, from the reviewers, the five reviewers, but, but still, we know that um, maybe certain things could have been done better, right? So these are the sort of arguments we are looking for, not just summarizing a papers, uh, but, but really presenting arguments this is what, um, what we expect. This is what will end the, the 10% here. Uh, and this is tied to this idea that when you are synthesizing literature, uh, one of the things you are, you are attempting to do is number one, you're trying to contextualize or link it to whatever it is you're doing. You're trying to identify the gaps and the fundamental flaws in the paper, right? This would mostly, this would usually be presented as arguments. Any other thoughts? I hope that answers your question, Francis. Ah, uh, yes. Any other comments? Oh, if there are no comments, then we can, I guess, uh, proceed. All right, so I was just saying that we got to a stage where I think everybody knows how to use a, a Jupyter Notebook uh, or a Google Colab, which is a good thing. Uh, so we jump right uh, straight into Python. So we're getting our hands dirty today. And I'm, 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 we are likely going to cruise on certain parts because um, I would like for us to get all the way up to chapter four here today. We wrap up so that we start uh, our discussion of lecture series number three next week. The idea of this uh, lecture series is just to, to point you in the right direction. Uh, what you will notice if you haven't used Python before, for instance, is that it's not different from any other language, right? You just have to familiarize yourself with, uh, with, with, the, with the syntax. And what I do is I mostly focus on, on things that I feel are going to be very relevant um, when it comes to, to the things we're going to be doing in 741, right? Uh, so during our discussion of data structures, you notice that we just restrict ourselves to these sets and uh, list sets, tuples, and, and, and dictionaries, really. Um, these are the things I think you can, you can pick them up on your own. Uh, uh, and also, the key thing here is to make sure that uh, people are going to be able to make sense out of, out of the 
the code, right? That will be sharing via these Jupyter notebooks, right? I think on that note, I should just uh, open this up so that. Um, So that, uh, all right. I don't know if this is going to be confusing. I was hoping I could use JupyterLab today, but maybe not put this fine, I guess. I don't know. That's okay. All right, so we want you to be able to work through, or to be able to play this notebook and make sense out of it. That's, that's the goal. That's one of the reasons why we're doing this day. All right, so we're just going to look at brief introduction, installation and setup. I'm going to assume, I will quickly go through this, but I'm just going to assume that people have already installed Python. Um, the, the setup uh, works without a problem. You familiarize yourself with uh, a few basic bash scripts, and then we'll jump right straight through to the basics of Python, um, and then try and see if we can look at some data structures and how we get to use them. Briefly discuss flow control, um, look at how we we create functions and how we, we, we use modules, libraries and modules, right? Essentially just import statements really. And then I would like for us to spend quite a bit of time discussing the core um, libraries that we use here. So mostly scikit-learn, uh, pandas, matplotlib. Um, these are the core modules that, that we, we mostly use in this course. I mean, some of these things will probably pop up uh, I will explain um, explain their purpose uh, once we get to that stage. Like uh, I think uh, at some stage we start uh, we start looking at uh, libraries such as Joblib, and I'll explain what what exactly they are used for. Uh, just to mention that uh, today's course, I think part of it actually is um, you can you can click the binder link if you go to to this URL here. You should be able to you should be able to play around with the notebook, right? As I'm walking you through this. So just click on the on the launch finder link there and then it should be fine. Um, but going forward, I will be updating this repository on a regular basis. Uh, this is just to help you get, get started. And then also, I've, I've noticed that uh, as we are waiting for, for the Astria site to be set up, it is becoming a, a bit tedious for us to to be sharing resources uh, as links via email, right? To say I've, I've uploaded the, uh, the videos and the slide decks. So what I've done is I've, I've set up um, a temporal Google Classroom site to help with the management. And this is actually going to be very useful for us uh, when you start submitting assessments, right? It's, it's a lot easier to manage those things this way rather than using emails. So please, at, uh, at your own time, maybe after class, you probably want to enroll into this this class. I'm not sure how long it's going to take for us to transition to Astria. But within this Google Classroom site, um, the source code and the data sets that are going to be used going forward will be made available, right? Uh, on the code snippets and data set section. So each lecture series will have a dedicated section. Um, that section will have the slide decks and the handouts, right? We'll have uh, um, we we'll have uh, material associated with the recording and the chat transcripts in the chat itself and the code, right? So all you have to do is uh, go to go to Google Classroom. Once you're in Rome, you just go to classroom.google.com and then you choose the site. It's a 2020-21 CSC 741. Um, and then you just go under coursework and then you should be able to find, uh, to find these things here, right? And then you can download download the resources if you want. Submitting assignment is simple as well, same process. All right. Um, something else I uh, I thought I would mention is uh, what I normally do is besides adding the source code itself, I normally export the 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 Jupyter notebook as a PDF so that. Uh, so that you are able to read through the code snippets and the corresponding output without actually running the cells. If you find yourself in a situation where you are unable uh, to execute the code on your own, right? Uh, so remember when you have access to this Jupyter notebook, you can actually re-execute the code on your own, but if you're in a position where, or in a situation where you're unable to do this, um, 
I make available a PDF document, right? So this would be available as a, something similar to what I'm just going to showcase just now. Uh, lecture number two scripts, and then I'll say code. So it would be similar to, to this, right? Uh, so all you, all you do is you just go to an appropriate section that, that you want to understand. Like in this case, if I wanted to uh, look at, uh, um, I don't know, maybe using data sets or something, I'll just scroll here and then I'll be able to see the code snippet and the corresponding output. Uh, but all these things are, are will be made available via, um, via Google Classroom. Okay, so just to, to give you a bit of perspective, there's always a question that pops up. Those of you that attended the, the talk from public health will, will agree with me that there, 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 was, a, there was an interest in, in uh, how to get started in machine learning. And I remember responding uh, to one of the questions and telling them to say, is this way to get started is to use Python. Uh, if you go online and look at most of these curated lists, right, uh, that will uh, give you an idea of what sort of languages are used for solving specific problems. What you notice is that um, um, languages such as uh, Python um, are the, the, the language of choice when it comes to machine learning, right? Um, so you, yeah. Um, I hope this is good enough motivation here. But of course, I mean, once you learn the concepts, uh, if you feel comfortable using R or MATLAB, I've come across people that prefer to use MATLAB. Um, you can easily do that. Um, there are people, I'm sure, that use JavaScript to solve machine learning problems. That's fine also. Um, I also always like uh, showcasing this nice Easter egg here. So if you're interacting with the Python interpreter and, uh, and you just type in import this, uh, this is the sort of output that you, uh, you get back, the uh, Zen of Python. Interest. Most of these statements that are that I mentioned here will probably come up as we are discussing this, um, as we are looking at Python. So first off, I mean, if you compare Python with, with your average um, modern day programming language, high high level programming language, um, what you notice is that it's interpreted, right? Um, so you obviously need a, um, an interpreter. Um, once you are done with whatever program that you have been implementing, right? So in the event that let's say you're writing um, a web application using Flask, for instance, for somebody, for you to deploy that application, it needs to be deployed together with the Python interpreter. Um, it's also, for a very long time, it's been uh, referred to as a scripting language, um, in part because it's actually very, it's, it's very easy to, to, to use when, when being applied to solve these um, everyday problems that uh, people experience. Uh, so people like systems admin, administrators, for instance. So it's, in a way, it's, it's similar to bash, right? Bash scripting, for instance. Um, I, I find myself using a lot of Python for, for, for performing repetitive tasks that, that um, that would probably involve me writing a lot of code if I was to use a more verbose language like Java, for instance. Um, over the years, though, it's become general purpose also. So you have um, people that use Python in so many different uh, so many different situations. Um, increasingly, it's being used to build web applications, for instance. Um, uh, TK is it TK Kinta or something is uh, is one of those libraries that is used to implement desktop-based applications, right? So we see it being applied in various domains or various situations here. Uh, so it's general purpose in that way. Motivation, I guess, for you, if, um, if you are wondering whether it would be worth it to invest time to, to learn Python end-to-end, -end, right? You can apply it in so many different uh, instances. Uh, some examples of popular web applications that are implemented using Python is I always like uh, referring people to Plone, right? So if you just look up, uh, Plone, Plone uh, CMS, it's quite popular actually. It's implemented purely in Python. Um, I don't know if that's motivation for you, but, but yeah. And then interesting enough, it's also object oriented, right? Now, it's considered an object oriented pro pro programming language. 
Um, now we rarely look at that aspect in this course. It's going to be mostly just scripting. Uh, the most we'll do is maybe just create module files, right, that you can import elsewhere. Um, I recommend that uh, we, we go for at least examples, right? Going forward, I went to assume that we're using Python 3, right? So you want to make sure that uh, if you want to be able to replicate uh, the things that we'll be doing, you want to make sure you have version 3. So assume you're using version 3. If you're using an older version of Python, you'll notice that uh, there are certain things that are not available in version, version 2.7, for instance. So you want to, you really want to make sure you move to version, version 3. If you're like me uh, and you have various, uh, uh, various uh, versions of Python installed, you'd have to explicitly, if you notice, if I run just Python, right, um, I'll, I'll be using version 2.7, which is why I always, uh, I always run the Python 3 binary so that I have access to version 3, right? 3.6.9 in this case. Please feel free and interrupt me if you, uh, if you, if you need clarification or anything, right? Um, there's a couple of interesting things about, about Python. Remember I mentioned that it's a scripting language. Um, what that means is that you can, you can quickly prototype things and be able to execute and, and see how uh, whatever it is you're building is going to behave. Not only that, you also have access to an interactive interpreter, right? So the inter interactive interpreter uh, will make it possible for you to run code directly, right? So this is the interpreter I'm talking about here. Um, so you can really experiment with one-liners. I find myself, um, I find myself uh, doing this a lot. And in fact, this is so useful that, uh, that uh, I guess we can say hello or something. This is so useful such that uh, tools like Jupyter Lab, for instance, right? tools like Jupyter Lab will actually will actually uh, have a facility, right, that enables you to, um, to open up a terminal tab right within JupyterLab because they know that uh, you, you would want to experiment with maybe the, the interpreter right, right in there. Although, I mean, within a, a Jupyter notebook, you can pretty much, uh, you can pretty much also, uh, let me just get here and showcase the JupyterLab part I was talking about. You can, you can run uh, Python code without a problem. All right. Um, right, so you can open, open up a console right within here if you want to. Um, uh, you can also uh, open up a thing as well. This is what I meant here. All right, so uh, obviously that allows you to execute um, um, code on the fly, which, which can be tremendously useful here. Now the installation part, I'm just going to assume that you've already done this, but if you haven't and you want to get started, as is the case with, I guess, the fourth years that are joining us today, um, the nice place to start off from is uh, the downloads page on the official Python website. So you just go to python.org slash downloads. Uh, and what you want to do is just follow instructions specific to the operating system um, um, that you're using. Um, if you are using an operating system like Ubuntu or Debian operating system like I am, typically your package manager will allow you to install uh, Python without a problem, right? So sudo update install Python, and you should be able to, to really uh, install it without a problem, right? So you don't have to worry about um, about, about installing Python like that. But if you're using Windows, you obviously have to go to the downloads page and then uh, download that executable file and then follow the next, 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 next and install Python. Um, in terms of, an, uh, I don't wish for us to start uh, an IDE war here, but uh, there's always this question of what, what IDE should I use? Uh, for CSE 5741, I would say, just use Jupyter Notebook, right? Uh, just use Jupyter Notebooks and you should be good to go. Um, but if you get to a stage where you are seriously writing code in Python, um, I, I, I highly encourage you to go to this Stack Overflow thread here. 
right? It's closely monitored because of uh, the nature of such questions, obviously. Uh, but I like the fact that uh, there are numerous arguments that are presented on which IDE you should go for, right? Um, in my case, I've experimented with uh, tools such as uh, Kate, for instance. It's a generic, uh, it's a generic, well, a generic text editor, core text editor that is available um, via the KDE desktop environment. So if you're using Kubuntu, for instance. But I've also experimented, so this is Kate, by the way. Right, so with Kate, I can, I get to create so many different uh, files, um, and Kate is able to recognize, it's able to recognize uh, a number of different languages, right? So uh, if I'm, if we're looking at MIPS assembler, for instance, in the first year course that I teach, this is my go-to editor. Um, if I'm programming in Python, this is my go-to editor as well. I don't know where Python is, I can't see Python, but it should be syntax highlighting for Python as well. Um, but also, uh, if you are a programmer and you are obsessed with Visual Studio Code, there are plugins that will allow you uh, to write Python code, right? Uh, I do believe, uh, I do believe I have certain plugins installed here. If I can open up, uh, I think you should be able to automatically I hope this thing is going to, let me just see if I can save this to. Just. I hope it will be able to automatically detect this. Uh, yeah, I don't know if, I do have the extension. I don't know if you notice this, but the moment I was trying to type uh, keywords like uh, def, if I want to define a function, it automatically um, uh, uh, highlights that, right? So the syntax highlighting, if, you notice there's autocomplete also, right? If, because it knows it's Python, I can import also. Uh, so quite useful, um, you probably want to, can't quite remember which, which editor I, I mean, which particular uh, plugin I have, but I think it should be this. Yeah, MS Python or something, I don't know. Uh, clearly popular here, you notice that uh, there are 30, 34 million downloads. Right, I'm wondering if people are there, okay, they're still there. It's all quite on the Western Front. All right, so my, my recommendation on editors, I mean, uh, if, if you're not comfortable with Jupyter Notebook, I would suggest uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, but, but also, I mean, uh, if, if you're a person who's been programming for a very long time, um, you can get away with uh, Vim, for instance, uh, or one of my supervisors used to like the editor Joe, right? So, but anyway, so there you go. Um, this, is, this is a plugin that you probably want to, to look at. The, the last time I was looking at it last year, it was 17 million downloads, it's now at 34, if you notice. Um, and the beauty with the beauty with Visual Studio Code is you can actually also um, render Markdown, right? So you can you can actually view Jupyter notebooks right within uh, within Visual Visual Studio Code. All right, so I mean it's uh, Python is pretty interesting, similar to well, I was going to say JavaScript, but similar to languages such as I, I think Perl, if I'm not mistaken, really. You don't have to explicitly declare a data type, right? So the, the data type is inferred for you. Uh, all you do is you just define a variable. And depending on what sort of value you assign to the variable, um, then the data type is going to be inferred. So for instance, if I, if I, um, if I declare a variable called uh, 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 var CSC5741, and I assign this a string, just because I'm using a literal, right? The double quotes here, opening double quote and closing double quote, Python will know that uh, that that this thing here is is uh, is a string, right? So it's going to infer that it's a string. If I if I if I if I was to assign a floating point number, for instance, uh, ninety point five zero here, and I check the type. Um, it's going to infer that this is a 14 point value, right? So everything is inferred for you. Uh, no need to worry about uh, explicit, explicit variable declaration here. And um, this will come up a lot actually when we, are, 
we are working with uh, data uh, data structures such as list, for instance. If, uh, I was to define this, for instance, and check the type. Uh, Python will know that uh, that this is actually a list, right? So I put that. 5741. Python will know that it's a list, right? If I was to declare this um, as a set, Python will know that this is a set tree. So I don't have to worry about um, about explicit variable declaration, which is can be a good thing also. The the thing that you're going to find very painful though, unfortunately, and this will be a bit painful maybe the first week or two, just the first week actually, is this uh, idea that code has to be indented in Python. So there's nothing like uh, uh, parentheses or curly braces here in Python, right? To mark uh, the beginning or end of a code block, you use indentation, right? So you indent your code. For instance, if um, if you're defining a function in, in Java, what you would do whilst defining a function is you would have to, you, you do your usual uh, public class, uh, just like this here. You do the usual public, uh, you do public class uh, CSC5741, for instance, right? And it should have been uppercase here. And then you do this, right? Um, in Python, however, uh, what you do is uh, you indent code, right? So if I was wanting to define a function in Java, I mean, you, you do something like public uh, static void main, I suppose, or something, right? Like your main method. But in Python, what, what you end up doing is you indent your code. So indentation is very important. If I'm defining a function, if I'm defining a function, uh, in def keyword we talk about this, function name, so this would be your function signature here, uh, parenthesis with optional parameters. Instead of the, a brace, it's a full colon, right? After a full call, you need to indent the code to signal that what follows next is a body that is part of the function. And you see this coming up over and over again for things like uh, conditional statements, like loops, I'm sorry, like if, if statements, for instance, right? Uh, so I'll just say pass here. Um, maybe I should use the interpret actually. So if I wanted to create a function called uh, CS, FX CSC5741, for instance, this is what I would do, right? This is passed, right? And then I can use the function here. You don't do anything here, right? It's like maybe you can say return a print. I'm a function or something. Um, once you run this, right, um, it'll work. But if you don't indent this, right, it won't work, right? Error, and you see these errors come up over and over again. It will, it will, if you've not programmed in Python, you need uh, some getting used to here. In fact, what's even painful is that if there's a mismatch, right, in the indentation format that you're using, you will run into problems. So you can't use a mixture of uh, tabs and spaces. You have to be consistent. Um, what I do myself in the code I'm going to be sharing is I use four spaces, not a tab, but four spaces. So what I mean is, is imagine we are creating this function, right? And it has two statements, uh, sorry about that. Uh, imagine we are creating this function, right? Fx in uh, x or something. And it's going to have two statements. So I'm first of all going to use uh, four spaces and just say I will print uh, line one, right? The moment I use a tab here, I, I hope this will work here. I just use the tab and I, I say, I don't know if it's a file or this way, line two. You see that? It, even though you can, for you, right? If, if you think about it here, it's almost like they are aligned here, but there's inconsistency in the, the formatting of the um, or the indentation. I'm using a mixture of tabs and spaces. Um, if I were you, I would make a decision right now on the type of indentation that you're going to use going forward. Uh, again, we're not trying to start an indentation war here. The different people will, will tell you that uh, one is better than the other. Some people will 
come up with the argument that uh, pressing the tab button four times is more painful than, is, is so painful in comparison to just pressing the tab button once, right? I don't know, I use four spaces myself. Um, so indentation is key, right? I don't know if there are any thoughts, questions? Are you still there, I guess? Okay. All right, so uh, Python is case sensitive, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, age, all uppercase age is different from, uh, from all uppercase age. All uppercase age is different from camel case age, right? This is different from that. I do believe, I'm not sure if uh, there's a language that's not case sensitive. I think it's usually the case for most languages that uh, uh, casing is, is quite important. I, I think so, is it? Is Java case sensitive? I wonder, I don't know, I forgot. Very much. Nice. Okay, yeah, yeah. Except uh, now I know, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to, to start a war here, but uh, HTML is not case sensitive, right? Yes, yes, it's not a programming language, they say, but, but also, I don't know. Uh, also, SQL is not case sensitive as well. But anyway, although it's classic programming language. So um, also, there are specific rules, right? Um, associated with naming variables. Uh, you can use letters, uh, numbers or underbars, but you can't use any other punctuation, right? So what, what we mean here is that, uh, I guess I should, I'm gonna close this here and just open up, uh, I don't know if I have a new tab here. What, what we mean here is that, uh, this time we start using this, code blocks here. I hope this is visible enough, the size. <clears throat> so what we mean is that uh, a, a, um, a string like CSC 5741 is equal to uh, variable. This is fine, right? I don't think you can start with the number. I could be wrong here, right? So uh, you can only start with, um, you can only start with, um, with um, an alpha character, right? Uh, so you can't start with a number, but you can start with an underbar. So it works without a problem. So there are these rules that you need to, to be to be aware of. You can't start, the only punctuation that's allowed is obviously an underbar. You can't have uh, an exclamation mark as part of, uh, and this thing actually thinks that this is a, a magic, right? But you can't have an exclamation mark as part of your variable name, right? You get an error. You can't have a comma as part of the variable name. Obviously this makes sense also. Uh, so the only punctuation that is allowed is an underbar. You can't have a hyphen, so you can't say, CSC hyphen 5741, for instance, right? This will result in an error. But you can have CSC under bar uh, 5741. This would be fine also. And maybe we should have been printing this here. CSC 5741, right? Um, so there are all these rules that you need to be familiar with. You can't start with a number. Um, you cannot use, and this is the case for most programming languages, right? You cannot use um, um, any of the reserved words. Right, so you've probably already seen a number of them, like uh, the reserved word that enables you to, to create a function, right? So you can't say, I'm going to create a variable called def and then do that, right? Error, because this is a reserved word. Right? Now, uh, this raises the issue of uh, where, where do I check the reserved words? Well, the manual, obviously, but also, I, I quite like using the, um, I like using the, um, there's a keyword package that you have access to. So in your interpreter or within Jupyter Notebook or JupyterLab, if you're using JupyterLab or Google Colab actually, what you can do is you can say import keyword. 
once you QA is that is a keyword, not Q. You say import keyword. Within this import keyword, um, you will have access to a number of things here. We'll talk about some of these things, but um, you have access to a list, right? So if you say just uh, you have access to this KW list. Um, so what you can do, right, is just print out keyword.kw list. And then it will, it will list, uh, it will give you a, a list of, um, of all the keywords, right? So ideally what we're saying is you cannot name a variable as pass or raise or return or try or while or lambda or yield, right? Always useful, sometimes you find that you find yourself uh, experiencing an error and you'd be wondering what is going on, especially when you first of all get, get started. Um, this always comes in handy. But of course, for, for like, like with most languages, you can easily Google these things up, but sometimes, you know, having this information in your fingertips might be useful. Within the, uh, this module that I've just imported, you also have uh, a function, right? If you notice when I said uh, DIR, I talk about DIR just now. I will explain what this is all about. You have access to is keyword function, right? So this is a function here. If I if I check the type, right, of uh, keyword dot is keyword dot is keyword is keyword, you notice that this is a function. So what I can do with this is um, I could say, uh, let's say I'm writing code and I'm not uh, sure if return is a keyword or not. I'll just check is return a keyword, right? It is a keyword. Of course, uppercase return, right, is not a keyword because Python is case sensitive, right? So just bear in mind that um, that you cannot use either one of these uh, either one of these uh, uh, these these reserved words here. Uh, I don't know how many there are in Python 3, I keep forgetting here, but there are 33 of them. So not, not, not a very large number, but you don't have to memorize this. On that note, right, I, I think I should mention that sometimes you, um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the slides, but um, sometimes it's useful to download, uh, to download the manual, so you have an offline copy of the manual. Usually when you install Python, it comes uh, with the manual. Um, but what I do myself is I, uh, I have a way of keeping, I have a way of accessing my user. I use a tool called Zill, right? Uh, Zill documentation browser. And the reason why this is useful is um, I tend to use it for so many other different things besides Python, which is here. Um, you know, I can, I, can, I can incorporate, you know, uh, documentation associated with these different technology stacks, for instance, Bootstrap, if you're into your, your development, Markdown, if you're just getting started, Matplotlib, you know, MongoDB and all these things. Um, we will pause very soon to try and see if people can experiment with things, but trying to see if we can uh, just familiarize ourselves with some of these things here. All right, so when you, obviously, uh, when you're assigning a uh, value to a variable, you, you use uh, the equal sign as um, the assignment operator. So creating a variable involves you specifying the variable name, uh, the assignment operator, which is the equal sign, and the value. Uh, so age is equal to 19 means that I am uh, essentially defining a variable age, which is of type int. Now, now there are certain things that I'm going to be uh, typing a lot because sometimes I get lost myself and I always want to figure out the data type. Because remember, uh, you don't have to, you don't, uh, there's, no, there's nothing like specifying the uh, data type of the variable in Python, right? So sometimes it may be useful for you to ascertain what type of data type you're working with. So for instance, if I wanted to know what sort of data type this is, I'll just use the word type, right? And it tells me this is a list. If I wanted to know what sort of data type uh, this is, right? I'll just say uh, type age, right? And then it will tell me this is an integer, right? So quite useful type. Uh, you will see me doing a bunch of other things like using built-in commands like um, uh, like dir or help, for instance, the help function. What dir does is uh, when you're working with a new library or a module, 
and you don't know um, the functions um, uh, or the methods that you have access to, DIR is quite useful. So when I import keyword, for instance, I just say, uh, in fact, again, first of all, try and see what type is keyword, right? And this thing will tell me that this is a merge, right? Um, if I don't know what sort of things I have access to once I import this module keyword, I can just say DIR, right, uh, keyword, um, and then I'll have access to all of these things here. So I see that I have access to main, uh, KW list is keyword, right? All right, so I've already made mention of the fact that uh, you can't use uh, reserved uh, keywords as, um, as identifiers, essentially. So stay away from these 33 things here. Uh, which is why what you will notice, right? For me, this is my own personal naming convention, and I use this actually irrespective of the language I'm using. So when I'm writing JavaScript code, for instance, I, I tend to, to try and avoid some of these errors. I prefix things a certain way. So my convention, uh, I think I should say, that when I'm creating a variable, if I'm creating a variable age, I won't say age. Instead, I'll say var under bar age. And the reason is I try to avoid potential errors, right, associated with uh, using a reserved word. I, I find this useful, especially when I'm experimenting with so many different languages. Um, when I'm creating a function, you'll notice that I'll say uh, df, and then I'll say fxn, right, short form for function, and then under by the function name. This is my own naming convention. You don't have to use this convention if you don't want to. Um, but I just thought I'd, I'd mention why I, why I do this, right? Uh, of course, I don't do this for cl classes, right? Uh, but I thought I'd mention that. Um, I don't know if that's a... Uh, like, uh, No comment, okay, no comment. Any, any thoughts so far? Oh, uh, maybe if you're doing this for the first time, uh, uh, things that are common with some language that you've experimented with, if you haven't used Python before, perhaps, or some... Uh, hello? I have a question. Yes. How do you import like a scan? It's, oh, it's, it's kind of like if you're trying to accept in, input or something. Yes. Yeah, well, so Python is uh, it's quite useful, I think, so it's like I.O., right? I.O. type stuff. Well, it's, um, so what you do is um, you just use the import built-in function, right? So I'll just say uh, um, import, input, uh, enter first number, right? And then it will ask you to enter the first number. So I essentially what I could do here is just assign a variable here, so input one, you say equal sign, and then I'll have access to the variable, right? Once somebody says 54 here, I can check it. The thing though with the type is that this thing, right? Is going to be a string, so you need to cast it, yeah. So you, there's nothing like importing, right? You just use the built-in function called input. This is actually available to you within Python by default. Uh, so you just use a built-in function called input. Uh, so if you're performing a calculation, by default, it's going to be a string, obviously. You would have to cast this, right? So uh, casting is, uh, again, you use a built-in, right? If I wanted to cast, uh, if this is a number, I wanted to cast it to a float, for instance, I'll just say, um, you notice it's a string here, I'll just say uh, float. I'll use the float built-in, right? I'm just going to overload this, and then I'll have access to a float. And I can add numbers here. The mistake people will make when you're doing this for the first time, you say you define the first number, right? Import, say 54, and then you say number two, uh, right? Number two, and then somebody enters uh, four. You see, when you say you're going to add, uh, get a logical error here. When you're going to add uh, import, import one, and import two, you'll get 544, right? But in actual fact, you're trying to add 54 and four. So what, you're trying to, what you want to do is you want to cast it, right? So either you cast it to a float or you cast it to an int. So what you would do is I would say, uh, oh, what I wanted is not uh, var input one plus var input two, but rather uh, int, uh, sorry, int var input one plus int var input two. So you cast this int, uh, and then you should be able to get your desired output or something. So 58, yeah. Great question. Uh, 
eventually it was going to come up. I don't know if I was going to mention this, probably not, I don't know. Um, so something else uh, worth mentioning here is a uh, <clears throat> uh, comment, right? So you have one-liners and multi-line comments, obviously. Uh, you use the hash sign or the pound sign, as they call it elsewhere, for you to um, use an inline comment. So if you wanted to provide a comment um, alongside a statement, you'd just use a, um, you'd use a pound or a hash. Sorry. Uh, for multi-line comments, you use what are called doc strings here. Now, the beauty with Jupyter Notebook, for instance, when you're using Jupyter Notebook, what you notice is that uh, comments are highlighted for you. Uh, you notice here. So if I wanted to, uh, this variable is an integer or something, right? So this will work without a problem. How about that? All right, uh, but of course, so there are multi lines now. As you guessed, right, right, you can have, you can create multiple, multi line comments using numerous uh, hash, um, hash symbols, right, or these pound symbols. Uh, but this can be a bit tedious. Uh, you can you can take advantage of uh, doc strings. And it turns out that doc strings are are quite useful when you're creating documentation. This is where the name comes from. So. Usually when you're creating a module file or you're creating a class, you'd want to pay particular attention to the way you're documenting right? um, the class. You use doc strings. Um, when, when you are accessing things like uh, this module file, like if I say import module file, and I, within Jupyter Notebook, there's a shortcut that you'll find useful also, Alongside any variable that you've declared, if you just type a, uh, a question mark in front and you press shift enter, um, you have access to the doc stream, right? Essentially the documentation associated with, uh, with, with that particular uh, thing that you're using, the engine that you're using. Now what you see here, the description here, um, is, is, is made possible because of the doc strings, right? Uh, if, I, if we wanted to, Hmm. If we wanted to check uh, the built-in function print, for instance, you notice that it has a very useful um, doc string, right? That gives you more contextual information about how you get to use that built-in function, right? So it's not just the default that you use to print a variable, for instance, or a result. It turns out that there are optional arguments that you can feed it, right? Uh, all of these things that you are reading here are made possible because of doc strings. Very useful when you're creating something that is complex. Uh, like if you have class files or you create a, a module file that has a number of functions. And so you would want to, um, you would want to, to provide descriptive information about what you've created to whoever is going to use that thing. Or in fact, to you, when you use it two years or three years down the line and you'd have forgotten what you were doing, right? So the way you define doc strings is you just use a, Three single, uh, three single quotes, right? Opening quotes, right? And closing quotes. Or three double quotes and the closing double quotes. So you see these two examples here. This would be a multi-line comment using doc strings, right? Three opening single quotes, three closing single quotes. Three opening double quotes, three closing double quotes. And we, we see this in, in instances where, let's say, we wish to create um, a function. Um, called um, CSC5741, uh, which accepts um, one, one variable, I guess, input one. So the first thing you do is you create a doc string like so, right? There we go, doc string. This is an example of a doc string. And then you can, you can, you can, uh, you can, you can create things like a, uh, uh, some visually appealing, um, I, I guess, string to provide uh, information, say var input one is a uh, input value or something. Uh, and then you say return var input one, I guess type var input one or something. Now, so what I'm trying to showcase here is to say, if I, if I, I'm just going to create another cell below. If I run this, right, if I run this, 
And I, I, of course, the way that I will talk about functions just now, but, but, but if I run this with five, it will give me like a top, right? The thing though is, assuming I didn't know what this was about, right? I'll just uh, press a question mark in front and then it will give me that doc stream that I just specified, right? This is an example doc stream uh, parameter and whatnot. Uh, maybe this is not uh, visual appealing here. I could just copy here and then use the interpreter here. Uh, so this is what you would, uh, you would have access to. If you say, not DIR, but if you say help, and then you say FX, sorry about that. If you say help, and then you say FX, CSC 741, you have access to this doc string here. Quite useful when you're creating something that's complex. Now I'm, I'm rushing through here because I'm trying to get to a stage where we start talking about things that are more relevant. Just trying to give us um, pointers or hints on things that are going to be tremendously useful going forward. Uh, I like, besides DIR or the question mark within Jupyter Notebook, I like help. What help does is if I import something new, right? Like if I import, if I import a keyword, and I don't know what this is about, I'll first of all say help, right? And then it has a description, a detailed description. Now I know, right, you're thinking, well, but I have the manual. Yes, you can use the manual, but sometimes maybe you're much more productive when you're using the same interface for checking these things rather than context switching, right? So you can do this right within Jupyter Notebook, either using the question mark or using help dot in function. Right, so you have access to this. Um, now, you notice I keep mentioning things like help, uh, built-in functions, built-in functions. There are certain useful things that you have access to by default. These are within the standard Python library, so you don't have to import anything. Like for instance, reading files, right? When you're performing input-output operations, when you're handling exceptions, you don't need to import any packages because these are things that you, you expect to, to work with when you're programming, right? Uh, so you have access to them. They're called built-in functions. Um, I've forgotten exactly how to access built-ins, but uh, it's in Python, print built-in, built-in function, built-in functions or something. There should be a way um, of accessing built-in functions. Forgotten how, so there should be a stack overflow uh, thread here. Wow. Print all built-in functions. Oh, there we go. The, um, I mean, but, but I guess you figure things out as you are, you probably have to, there we go. There we go, excellent. So you say import built-ins, right? You go to your interpret, say oh, import built-ins, and then uh, let's try type. By the way, type itself is, uh, is a built-in, right? Um, Built-ins. No, there has to be something. What is this guy saying? Built print. Oh, the DIR built-ins, not print. And DIR itself is a built-in function. So you have access to all these different things. You notice some of these things are actually, um, uh, these are ex exception names, right? So if you're trying to handle an exception to do with uh, an non-existent file or something, these are things that you have access to by default, right? So tr uh, what, what else here? Input is there, it's a built-in. Open should be built in, I think. I don't know if I can, if you can see any open here. Uh, but because this is a, hmm, what type is this? This is like a chicken egg problem, right? We're checking for type if it's a built in, but type is what we're using to check these things here. So he said, so what we can do is we can, um, Let's see if we can find open here. Yeah, so there's open as well, right? It should be here. Um, oh, there we go, it's here. Right, so very useful. Um, you probably want to write this down somewhere, the list of built -ins. But some of these built you probably figure them out as you're working with uh, Python because it turns out that you won't use these things, right? Uh, some interesting things is if you are working with math uh, operators, for instance, um, you'll notice that you can import the math uh, uh, module, right? But 
but you also have access to built-in functions like PWT, right? So five power two, 25, right? Quite interesting here. Print itself is a built-in, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I like file myself because with file, right? Um, with file, what we can do is we can say, uh, Exit itself is a built-in function. With file, we can say, uh, we'll, we'll look at this file here. Oh, it's zero file. We'll look at this file here. Because it's a built-in function, we can say uh, var file input is equal to open, right? We can open this file here in read-only read mode, I guess. So we can open this file here, right? And if we check the type here, we'll have access to this file. Right, um, so we can run interesting things like, uh, uh, okay, I'll just read the first line, I guess. We can say var file input dot read line, right? And you see that the first line in this file is that uh, class declaration that we had here, public class CC 741, right? Um, anyway, so what I'm trying to say here is uh, um, you have access to certain things that, uh, uh, forgetting what we're talking about when we're discussing built-ins here. Any any thoughts so far? Oh, I think I was answering the question of uh, a scan or something, right? Which is a great question. Now, to talk about when you're handling input-output, right? I/O operations. We, I tend to not worry so much about. Um, um, Input operations, uh, input output operations that involve working with files, because it turns out that when we are when we start using uh, uh, libraries like pandas, right, um, all that stuff is abstracted for you, so you don't have to issue statements like var, I mean open, open the file in read-only mode, like what I was showcasing here. You don't have to do this, or you would do, right? Is you would um, you just import pandas. Let me showcase. You just import pandas and then just read it, right? So I could just import import panda showcase here, and then I would say just pandas dot read. I was just assuming that was a CSV file, for instance. I just say read CSV file here, right? And then it would read this file. Now, of course, I mean if the file is not a CSV file, right? Which is why pandas thinks that. Uh, uh, it thinks that uh, I'm, I'm using probably like a space as a separate or something, I don't know. But, but so you, you notice that with most of the libraries we're going to be using, we, we won't really directly work with, uh, like won't have to explicitly open files using the open built-in commands and the explicit close files. Because when you open, uh, when you're performing I/O operations like working with files, you open a file and read only. Once you read it, you have to explicitly close it, right? Uh, but with pandas, all that is done for you in the background, so it's abstracted. Anyway. Uh, but it's useful, I guess. Uh, I don't know when it would be used. Maybe if you find yourself um, processing the data before you actually use pandas, it might be useful. Uh, my workflow is different, though. When I'm processing data outside of pandas, I will use an external tool, right? Maybe Bash, for instance, uh, or uh, specific tools, right? Like orc uh, or said. Any any thoughts so far? Maybe it's things that um, we will get to a stage where we pause and experiment with some of these things shortly. But um, I wanted to find out if people have uh, thoughts or comments or something. A quick question, sir. Yes. Uh, I wanted to find out if the declaration of allies is similar as it is in Java and Python. Because in Java, there is one whereby you create a default one, and the other one is also uh, whereby you declare and initialize an alley. So I wanted to find out in, if it, in Python it's as well similar as in Java. Well, so the thing, right, the, the, the declaration of an array, because uh, there's no explicit data type uh, declaration, the data type is inferred, there's no such thing. But uh, an array in, in Python, by the way, is a list, right? So the way that you define, I will talk about data structures just now, is you, you, um, you use the, um, the symbols, right, or the characters that I use to uh, specify what an array is. It's just square brackets. So if I wanted to create a, an array, as you're calling it, it's a list in Python, let's say, uh, 
uh, courses. Uh, or people, I, I guess, well, uh, characters or something. I don't know, I'm forgetting here. I'll just use uh, square brackets, right? Uh, where I have four, one, two, uh, exclamation mark, right? So this in itself is, uh, uh, is, is a list or an array. So you, you, you do this. The moment you are assigning a variable, to a data structure like this, then it knows it's an array. Uh, I mean, in case you're thinking, well, but why would you create an empty list then, or an empty array? Well, I mean, so, <laughs> that just answered your question. One, one way is just to create an empty array, right, like that. But also, you would say, uh, you just use uh, the, the built-in function called list, right, so just a list, right? And, and then you say type and say the list or something. Now, I mean, so once you're using this thing, you can run the, the usual things, like you can append stuff, right? Um, and these things you can probably, and then once you check the type or you, you just print out the list, it will have those entries, right? So, and by the way, this, this built-in function is quite useful. It will come in handy. There are certain times when you're working with uh, pandas, for instance. Let's say it's a series or a data frame, a series actually and you are wanting to process it somehow, um, uh, it is sometimes necessary that you convert a series into a list or a set, right? And then back into a list something. So this built-in function is quite useful. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if that answers uh, the question here. Uh, I, I, so the, again, the goal here is, uh, it's called a crash, I'm saying crash course because I'm trying to point us to specific things that will come in handy once we, we, start, um, we start writing short snippets of code. The one thing that makes uh, the implementation part of what we're doing trivial is that most of the things are already done for us, right? Now, when we get to the stage where we're trying to study the estimators and how they work under the hood, that's a completely different argument altogether. But I mean, if you're a person who is just interested in applying um, machine learning techniques to a particular problem and you don't care what uh, Kenya's neighbor is all about, how it works or um, how uh, support vector uh, classifier or support vector machines work under the hood, you can get away with that because all you do is you just need to know how to use that particular, uh, how to access a sub an SV SVC, right, from within scikit-learn for instance. Um, yeah. Any any thoughts? Uh, my introduction to Python was uh, was uh, in 2011, and I've never looked back since. Right? I uh, I've never, especially when it comes to scripting. I do a lot of scripting. I'm, I I don't consider myself a programmer. I've never really. Uh, well, I have written software, but not uh, not complex software like some of you do for a living. Uh, but I found that Python, uh, when I'm scripting, when I'm crawling for information, for instance, comes in quite handy. But of course, the same can be said for any type of language. If you've mastered Java, I'm sure you can do the same thing with Java. The beauty, though, is uh, most of the things are just one-liners in Python. Just um, you can do so much, very expressive, right? You can do so much in very few lines of code. Um, all right, so I, I did talk about, uh, I mean, I, I briefly introduced data types here. Uh, some data types with, with uh, familiarizing ourselves with uh, integers, right? Uh, floating point values, uh, strings, and Boolean, I guess. Uh, we talk about some complex data types like list just now, but I guess this this would this should suffice for now. Um, and again, the way that you you sort of like uh, specify what sort of data type is, you just feed a variable a value, and Python will know. You can cast from one value to the other, right? By by using built-in functions. So, for instance, if you wanted to uh, if you wanted to convert because because uh, this number here, var number, is a, is a floating point number, 
if you wanted to convert it into a string, you just use uh, the str built in function, and you just say built in number. Uh, and then you notice that it has uh, quotations, it's the string here. If I check the type here, um, I'm just changing the functions, I'll get string, right? It's a string type. I can again further cast it, for whatever reason, right? I can cast this, hopefully I will be able to cast this into an int, I hope, I don't know. Nope. But I can cast it back into a float and I'll get it back, right? If this was, um, if this was an integer, like 50, I could say I want to convert uh, uh, 50 into a string, like it's 50 cents, I guess, 50 into a string, str, but I can again cast it back to an integer, right? Uh, chaining is quite useful. I, uh, this is what makes Python really powerful. Right? You can chain so many different commands and, uh, and be able to do so much more in just one line of code. All right, I'm just showcasing uh, how you'd, uh, you'd specify the data type of the variable here right, implicitly. Um, which is just, just using assignment operator, you, you, you define a variable and then you assign it a value. Yeah, so uh, a Boolean data type is nothing more than a true or false here. Um, the point to note here is if you were paying particular attention to to the um, to the keywords in Python, one of the three keywords is true and false, but cases very important, right? Uh, uppercase T, uppercase F, right? So what we mean is that you can create a variable called true and assign it. Uh, this is valid, but you cannot do this with uppercase T because it's a reserved word. So if you wish to create a boolean. Um, value, for instance, would say uh, value boolean is equal to true, right? If I check the type, I would uh, I would see that it's a boolean bool, right? Um, I mean, th this might be useful if you are processing information uh, in some 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 looping construct or something like a while loop or a for loop or something. Um, but yeah. And then the normal things like you probably have, uh, if you see this right. Here. If you see this right. Hello. Sir. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I would want to find out if you can if you can perform a loop in in Python. Yeah, well, loops are quite common for all languages. We we do get to that. Yeah, it's quite easy actually for I in in uh, let's say I want to loop through one, two, and uh, Z or something. This is how you perform the loop, one, two, three, four. When you just print I. It is, it's not as, uh, I've forgotten my Java here, but uh, it's quite, quite robust here, right? So you can, you can actually. So things like four I in range, 100. Print I or something, I don't know. Yeah, so, so yes, you can. Uh, these while loops as well. And we talk about, about uh, looping constructs just now. Um, yes. All right, thanks. Right. Yeah, so some pretty interesting things here is, uh, is that uh, normally, I mean, uh, if, if normally these things are if you, if you say this is equal to true, you get false. So there's certain, certain, um, there's certain data structure, certain values that are, um, are considered false if they're in a certain state, like an empty list, for instance. So if I have a list with one element and I try and check if this is equal to true, is, is this false or true? Well, it's false, right? Is it false? Is this my, hmm, am I confusing? It's supposed to be true. But it has a value though. Ideally, and, and something that's empty, or is it? 
Hmm. I have to look into this, but maybe none is equal to true. What? Oh, right. So yeah, for none, none is equal to true because uh, none is false, right? But if we say none, not, not none should be equal to true, right? You know, so uh, not, by the way, is a built-in function. And I don't know if and is a built-in function. Is it? Yeah, I think it is. And true. I don't know if this is it. I don't know how and works. I'll have to check how and works. I've forgotten. I don't know. I'm sure there's no no no. What am I what am I doing here? True and <laughs> true and false. Right? It's false. But true and true is true. What was I doing there? It's the same with all, right? So you have access to all. But you also have shorthand notations also. So false or true is true, right? But you also have short shorthand notations. So true and true. Is it one and I think? Yeah, just one and. Uh, so these these are same symbols I think that are used in things like Java, right? So false or so all can be used using a pipe symbol. I think false not false. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just uh, this point here. I like using this point here. Sometimes uh, you come across code that will have some very weird condition, and you'll be sitting there wondering, why is this condition possible, right? Like if you're processing a list and you are popping out elements, right, and you have this condition that checks if um, if the list is empty, right? Because it will, if it's empty, it's going to result to false. You can use that as a condition essentially. It's a quite handy. Although, I mean, you could achieve the same purpose. Uh, you can achieve the same goal by using a completely different approach. But it turns out you, you are more expressive if you use that sort of shorthand notation. Um, sometimes, I mean, you would want to, uh, to, to come up with code um, that is of functionality that is wrapped around a certain structure so that you can reuse it elsewhere, right? Um, as is the case with most functions. I mean, with most languages, you have functions in Python also. Um, and uh, uh, so what you do is once you define um, your function uh, and it's statically correct, the way that you evoke it, you use the function name followed by opening parentheses, closing parentheses, and optionally, if you've defined parameters, uh, you specify the parameter. In which case, it will be arguments, right? Once you are executing the function. Um, right, so this is what we're saying here. Uh, so you, you can define a function with parameters, right? And when you evoke it, you have to specify the argument, the actual. So you define it with an argument and specify the actual parameters, or the other way around, I don't know. Um, uh, so the way you do it to evoke a function that requires you to specify such an argument, actually. Um, is within the parentheses you specify the argument. Um, I did bring up the issue of uh, built-in functions. Very, very useful. Uh, I, I mean, there's so many of them. Uh, I tend to gravitate more for the general purpose ones like print. Print is probably one of those, uh, uh, probably one of those, uh, built-in functions that you use often, right? You almost always want to see the output of something. Um, then sometimes maybe you want to be more interactive and so you'd use, a, you'd use the input um, built-in function. In Jupyter Notebook, um, it might be different from um, what you're seeing on the, um, the, uh, the console here, right? In Jupyter Notebook, there's a very nice uh, uh, interface that comes your way if you say input uh, enter value or something. If I run this, it's a very nice uh, textbook that comes up here. I just say hello or something, and then you just press enter or something. Um, yeah, but, but just to, again, emphasize the fact that there are some useful built-in functions that are going to come in handy. And in fact, you will see a lot of them in exemplar code snippets. 
that I'm going to showcase um, in the notebooks that I'll be sharing. Um, defining a function, I uh, did mention here, quite easy. You start by specifying the uh, reserved way uh, DEF, short form for definition, so it's a function definition, followed by the function name. Now the name of the function follows the same rules, variable naming rules, so you cannot start the function name with a number. Uh, you can only use uh, one character, which is an underbar, right? punctuation, which is an underbar. You can have a mixture of numbers and uh, alpha characters. Uh, but you can only start with alpha characters and numeric characters. Um, there are some other interesting things that you will see in the code snippets online or in the notebooks that I'll be sharing. You can assign default values to uh, parameters. Um, it may be handy, right, in instances where you don't want a user to, um, to run into an error or something. Right? Uh, the return um, statement is optional because it turns out that you can have a function that doesn't return a value. Like this is the case with most languages. Uh, so maybe you just want to print out an output. Uh, indentation is very important. I deliberately included this here because if I say return zero here, this would be an error, right? This is an error because the indentation is wrong. If I, if we come here and we say we wish to define a function, we are calling this function CSE 741, right? 741. And you notice it's, uh, Jupyter not, the Jupyter notebook indents this for you um, uh, without an issue here. So I say print x plus y, and we'll just say print x plus y. I'm just trying to make sure that uh, we have um, Same thing we have here, the same x to y, y is equal to z. So we have x, we have y is equal to default value, and uh, z is equal to default value z. Right? Now, I did say return zero here, right? This return, well, this thing is working, why? The indentation is wrong here, though. Right, it's supposed it's wrong. I don't know why Jupyter Notebook here is giving us a correct answer here. But the, the idea of uh, default values here is I can evoke this function with just two values, and I won't run into an error. Right, I I, I can evoke this function by calling. Uh, I'll just execute this again, and then I'll call CSV741 and then just call it with uh, one, with one, with just one value actually, and, uh, ooh. Oh, sorry, I, I can't, uh, one here because plus one is an int, you can't add an int to a string, but maybe if I, I'll call it with, uh, with a string A, right? Um, and you should be able to work without a problem, right? Um, why? Because, because I have default values. But if I didn't have these default values here, right, and I try to run this function, I will get an error. An error because uh, this function definition says that my function accepts three parameters, right? It's expecting error. You get the point. Uh, you can define default values. Very, very useful. I just rerun it so I don't run anything. Yeah. All right, and then and then you have um, so you also have some some other data structures that um, will come in handy actually, right? When you're processing information, uh, because it turns out that we're going to do a lot of processing, right? So when you first collect your data, for instance. You might want to perform an operation to all the values in a particular column of your pandas data frame. Um, it might become necessary for you to, not it might, but it becomes necessary sometimes for you to pluck out the values of that data frame, convert it into a list, apply the operation, convert it back into a series, and then inject it back there, 
Although, I mean, you can use the apply function to, to just perform that function on the series. Right? Um, but the, the number of use cases where you, you find uh, yourself working with these sort of data structures. Now, the interesting thing about these data structures in Python is that, uh, of course, I mean, in dictionaries, it's, uh, this thing here is, is a bit different from the others because you have the key value pair, right? Um, so the use cases are pretty obvious. Um, but, but people always get confused when, when you're discussing triples and lists, right? Um, I always like, I always like uh, emphasizing the fact that the tuple is considered to be much more efficient than a list because it's immutable. So you can't, once you, uh, you have things associated with the tuple, you can't change them. It's like a string, right? A string in Python is immutable, right? You can't change it. A list, on the other hand, can be changed. Uh, so what we mean here is uh, if we have a tuple, right? A tuple, a tuple, and we define it to be equal to one, two, and a, right? We can't, you see, we, we have the first term as one. We can't say this is equal to five, right? Because it's immutable. But, but if we create a list, yeah? If we create a list, now, because it's immutable, obviously it's bound to be more efficient, right? If we create a list, on the other hand, right, and we, we check what is in, in the first element, right? We can change what is in the first element and change it to, to be equal to 741. And when we check what, we check our list, we'll find 741, right? Um, this has huge implications, right? Depending on what it is you're doing, you need to be aware of the fact that you cannot uh, change values in a tuple. Like if you're trying to perform an operation to all the um, list item, all the items in your data structure, for instance, you must be aware of the fact that you can't do this with a tuple. Um, the way I like setting sets apart from these other data structures uh, is the fact that a set only comprises of unique entries. So you can't have duplicates with the set. Again, a very useful attribute, um, uh, depending on what sort of processing you are, you are performing, right? What sort of operation you're performing. So what we mean is that uh, with a list, right? You can get away with uh, something like one, two, a, one, 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 two, a, one, one, one. If I say list here or have all the duplicate entries. But if I say var set and define a set with that, I will only have unique entries. Sorry, this is not a set because the set needs to have um, these curly brushes. If I speak an A, we'll have just three items because it, 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 it only returns, it removes duplicates. Right? Again, a very useful attribute. Um, sometimes, um, in my, in my case, I, for some strange reason, for some odd reason, I, my, mind, my mind works best with lists or arrays, as somebody already mentioned. And so what I like doing is, if I'm trying to deduplicate information and I want to work with lists, what I do is I, I cast, right? So I will, I will have this set, but afterwards I will just cast it too, using the list doting function and then I'll have access to a list and then I can perform all the wonderful list functions, right? So like I append, for instance, um, I can append um, 100, right? And then, um, anyway, I can append 100 and, and, and have a, maybe x is equal to 100, and then by x we'll have, a, uh, this thing, I think it, went away. Anyway, uh, it, might be, it might become necessary for you to do that in certain instances. Um, maybe not, I don't know, right? Um, I, I don't know if we can pause for a little while here before. There is a very short exercise that I thought, we, uh, and I, I don't know if I made a mistake by, um, defining an exercise, 
after we look at these very basics here, but I'm just trying to see if we can just uh, get ourselves warmed up um, to try and see how we can use uh, these, different, uh, these different constructs here. Um, I don't know. Any thoughts so far about data structures or no? Uh, so your, your, your looping constructs, again, uh, just checking if I'm still online here. I don't know if, I think so. Uh, I have a question. Yes. I'm trying to figure out the difference between these four data structures, the tuple, list, um, dictionary set. Right, uh, so the, the fundamental difference is in the way that you define them, right? If you notice, uh, I'm going for the obvious here. <laughs> um, you define a tuple by, by using uh, parentheses. You define a list by using square brackets. Um, you define a dictionary and a set using braces, right? The difference between a dictionary and a set is that the dictionary is, has a key-weighted pair, a key-value pair, sorry. So you have a... Um, you have a key that will enable you to gain access to a particular value that you want. Right? Um, the other difference is in the fact that uh, some of these data structures are mutable, some of them are immutable. Actually, all of them are mutable with the exception of tuples. Um, the other difference is the functions that you have access to um, when you're working with these data structures. Right? So, so really, in some instances, it's just, uh, Scenarios where you can apply these data structures with this. That's another way of looking at the differences. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but, uh, but of course, I mean, because this is, um, there are certain built-in functions that can be applied to all data structures. So observe, if we say we, we have a var, we'll start with a tuple. Um, it has items one, two, Three. Three. We have a list which has items one, two, three, three. We have a set which has, it will only have one, two, three, right? Because the set doesn't have anything. But we also have a dictionary. I'll just call it dict, right? Is equal to key value pair, one, two, three. Now, all of these things here, you can check the, uh, the number of items you have there using the, the lane built-in function. So set will have not four, but three, because no duplicates there. List will have four, top will have four. Again, if you're wanting to gain a sense of the sort of um, um, operations you can perform on these values, the DIR method is quite the built-in function is quite useful. So I can say uh, DIR var triple, right? And I have access to all these things here. Um, set, right? You will find that, uh, you notice this? Um, for a set, right, for obvious reasons, you have, uh, remember those from grade one, right? What is the intersection of set A and set B or something? You have them here as well, right? Uh, you can get the difference of the set, the intersection, and all those kinds of things. So the operations that you can perform are different. If we check, at least different also. Um, I don't know if this is helpful or something, but. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you, the obvious thing is because uh, a set is immutable, you can't pop out elements, right? Observe, if I have a list, Right, I have three. I can say pop, and this is a, it pops out. Uh, I think the last item I check the list, it only have three. I pop, uh, it only have two now. I pop until it be empty, right? But I, I can't do that to a turbo, right? I can't pop a turbo because uh, can I pop? Nope, you can't. Mutable, no pop here, not not the pop, but uh, uh, but. But so again, the difference is in what sort of operations you can perform and, and I think how you, you get to work with these things. Uh, the other interesting thing though is that not only can you perform length, but all of these things are iterable, right? So you can look through them. 
and we talk about loops just now. So I can say I have a tuple here, right? I can just loop in var tuple because it's high nice tuple, right? And then I'll just print all the items one at a time. And then I'll have them there. Of course, you can't push anything into a tuple now, can you? Uh, I can't push. Can you push? But I think we can push something into a list or something, I don't know. No? Is there no push? I thought there was a, why is the push? I don't know. I thought there was a push command. Sorry, my bad. I don't know. So, insert, I guess. Or append, not insert, append. So insert and append, these are, these are all interesting methods that sometimes you, you will use them, sometimes you won't, I don't know. But, uh, you know, append, you're adding it to, towards the end or something, um, I guess. I don't know what insert does. Uh, the beauty is with Python, you can just say help dot insert and then it will show you what it does. So inserting it before the index, beautiful. So if we have, um, if I have a list like this, if we say insert, I don't, I don't know how many, how many variables does it have? How many things does it, the index and the object, okay. So we can say we want to insert, we want to insert at index zero, the value csv 7 foot one, right? So this will be before one, right, in here. <clears throat> it might be useful, sometimes it might not be useful, I don't know, I mean, it's, the usage is contextual, obviously. Um, I'm looking at the time, I'm trying to get us to a stage where we will be able to install the modules. I think that's the most important thing, maybe. Uh, maybe we can continue part of it next week, I don't know. Um, so besides, besides uh, the data structures, you have loops, right? Uh, as with most languages, the, 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 you, have, you have the for loop, you have the while loop, you have do while loops as well. Or you can implement the do while loop, I guess. Um, so looping is quite easy in Python, right? Uh, it's as easy as just uh, starting with the for, looping with, defining a for loop. It's as easy as just starting with the for uh, reserved word, followed by the variable that's going to keep track of what you're looping uh, through, and then the in reserved word, and what you want to loop through. You might want to loop through a file, you might want to loop through a predefined list, a tuple, anything that's iterable. You might want to look through a data frame or a series, right, in pandas, and we'll do a lot of this actually. Um, yeah, so this is very simple syntax here. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of um, an example, but anyway, it's, as long as you just provide something that you want to iterate through, this is the syntax that you have. Um, so the idea is the same as in any other language. You use a for loop when you, you know what your end goal is, right? You use a while loop if you don't know, right? You don't know when you want to, to stop looping, right? Um, so uh, obviously with your while loop, you can break out of the while loop, so you can use the break reserved word. Once a particular condition is, um, is uh, satisfied, like for instance, if you're looping through a file, you don't know how long it is, so you can't use a for loop, right? Maybe you can implement a for loop or something, but the wise thing to do is you use a while loop, while true. Read the file, right? Read the file until there's nothing to read anymore. I don't know if this is making sense. Um, so if we, and this is a good enough example here. If we want to read through csf71.java, right? one line at a time. What we would do is we'd say, and we are in here, would uh, say uh, we want file input. And maybe we should use Jupyter notebook here, um, just here, it's fine. Would say var file input is equal to open. The name of the file is uh, csc5741.py and want to open this in read mode, right? Just want to read this. So what we could do is we could say while true. 
we are saying, uh, uh, let's see here, we're going to say var file input dot read line, right? So we are reading one line at a time. Once we read this line, we can put a check, right? A condition to say, if, if what we are reading, right? Var file input, I guess, I don't know, is, um, is zero, right? So if there's nothing here, then we're gonna break out of this loop. Otherwise, we will say print the line, right? Var file input or something. So, um, sorry about that. While true, there we go. We should have uh, said uh, var len or something is equal to that. So we're saying if var len is equal to zero, I want to get the length of that. We're going to break, otherwise we will print, we will print valen or something. And I think it's not working because we need to reread this, I guess, again, I think. I don't know, we already looked through that. So we say all true. Valen, if valen is less than this, I hope this works now, we break. We exit the loop, otherwise we will print valid. What? I wonder, oh, so this is, uh, sorry, if we <laughs> if we check the file, right, and this is where debugging skills come in. If we check this file, it's an empty file, right? There's nothing there. Uh, but if we use, uh, if we use uh, the Java file, so we're gonna change this and say, this is not the Pi, but the Java. And then we can say, um, while true, we will check if we will assign this. And then we'll check if valen is zero, we will say break. There we go, so we print. So the, the idea here is you have this file, you have no idea um, how large it is. Like assuming it's a CSP file that has a, a record on each line and you don't know how many records you have in there. You're blind, right? What you do is you can use a while loop and just terminate once there's nothing more to read, essentially. Just showcasing a classic example of when you might want to use a while loop. Um, again, I, I know we're cruising through this, but, but the idea is just to give us an idea of some of the things that we're going to use often. Um, so it turns out that you, we will soon see that uh, the real power in Python lies in the availability of so many different libraries and modules, right? Um, that allow us to do a lot of amazing things, right? Enter the order of modules, right? Um, so the idea behind modules is uh, extensibility. You can view these as being, uh, I think they're called libraries in, what are they called in Java? What do you import in Java? Do you import libraries or something? I forgot the name. Uh, Packages. Oh, right, okay. Right, so import a package, right? Um, uh, and I'm trying to think, in, in Python, we actually, we import modules, right? And the module is nothing more than a collection of functions and classes sometimes wrapped in a file. So essentially any .py file is considered a module because for you to use that, you need to import it first. Uh, you import it using the import keyword, right? Um, and once you import it, you actually have access to, you have access to, uh, to the functions or methods or something. And, and this is where the import statement comes in, import pandas or import maths. Is it math? Math, right? And then we'll have access to math dot a cosine, math dot, uh, I don't know what else, math dot pi, right? You know, um, I don't know what, ooh, I didn't know there was math dot gcd. Greatest common device or something between five and twenty-five or something. I don't know, but but so so you use it using the import um, keyword. Now the interesting thing about the import keyword is it's used. There's two syntax. You can directly import uh, a module, right? Um, everything in that module by just using the import statement. So import module name. Alternatively, you can selectively import what you want, right? 
So you could say from the math package, I don't want everything in the math package. I don't want all of these things here. I only want one thing, right? Maybe I want to perform the square root, right? But I, I, I don't need the, um, the cosine, the factorial, or the flow function. Well, you can you can use the this syntax here. So from module import particular thing you want. So from math import square root. Now the the, the difference is is really just minor, right? The way that you get to use what you're importing. When I import everything, if I say import math, I need to use the dot operator for me to access what I want. So math dot what I want, right? Math dot whatever. But if I say from math import Square root, then I can use the square root direct, right? So, so it, it, it becomes available to you like, uh, you know, built in function, really. Um, um, I, um, I use the combination of all these two in my examples, and I, I guess when you want to use one is context, it depends. If you are making use of um, a module where you're probably going to use more than half. Um, the entities available there, right? Attributes and methods and functions and whatnot, then you're better off just using the, importing the whole thing. Otherwise you want to be selective. Come up with much more efficient code that way. Right, so just uh, uh, examples on how you do this, right? Uh, quite trivial really. Uh, sometimes um, when you, you still use the from syntax, you can use the asterisk as um, a way of importing everything. So if you're not happy with the dot operator, when you say import math, what you can do is say from math, import everything. And then now I'll have access to GCD without math dot. Right? But, but, but uh, I guess code is more readable when you actually use the dot operator because somebody can intuitively know where um, the entity you're making reference to is coming from. Uh, but ultimately, I think the choice is yours, actually. So, so I, I wanted to find out if maybe we can just, uh, I'm looking at the time here. I'm, I wanted to find out if maybe we can quickly pause here. We don't want to, do you want us to pause and then we're just gonna rerun this, clear this. And then uh, I wonder if we can work through this very simple thing here. I don't know, maybe just five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, it's becoming a bit redundant. I mean, subsequent sessions won't be like this where we, uh, we are looking at practical sessions like this. It would be theory, like I said, uh, lump of practical, but I wanted us to get to a stage where we, we have an idea of what sort of things in Python we would be interested in. So I wonder if we can, we can come up with an implementation, right? a function that uh, that takes in a value, a percentage between zero and 100, obviously. And then it, uh, it returns a combination of the grade, the description, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, G, the, the grade point average is the GP, right? The grade point associated with that score. Do, do we think we can pause for five minutes and then just have people think about this and then, um, Let's say at uh, 1955, maybe we can, we can see what people have. So we'll just pause for about five minutes, seven minutes actually. Let's see if we can implement this, right? Simple Python code, right? Doesn't have to be a, well, it can be a function, okay. Let's write a function, right? That takes in one variable, which is um, a score, and then it returns the grade, it returns the grade, the description, and the grade point average. Now I know we probably didn't talk about, uh, I don't know how we missed the if statements here. If statements in if uh, use the, it's the same syntax, but um, if, obviously use indentation instead of the braces, but instead of else if, it's elif. Right, elif is what is else if. So let's see if we can maybe just pause and then try and see if we can we'll reconvene, uh, we'll reconvene uh, at uh, 1955. Let's see if we can work through this.
So, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, people made the, uh, sorry, I'm one minute late, uh, someone called and uh, those uh, very strange calls where a senior colleague calls and uh, you don't know whether to ignore and pretend like you're sleeping or something, but I had to pick up the call. Um, is, uh, is there anyone who might, who's managed to just implement the for this question? Actually, is it to use a for loop or just if? Well, you can use a, even an if or something, that's fine. Okay, let me give it a try. Oh, do you want to share your screen? Uh, no, I, just, I was just writing like on a paper. <laughs> okay, I see. Is there anyone who was actually implementing it on Jupyter Notebook who wants to share their screen or something? I know there are programmers here that probably do this in Python. Uh, uh, with... Oh, Roy, you want to share a screen? Um, not as yet. Uh, could you just reshare the the screen with yeah. the sure, of course. the grades? Yeah. yeah. Okay, just five minutes. Okay. Maybe there's, uh, we have a lot of software develop developers. I know there are people that uh, that probably write Python for a living here. Surely they should be. Um, it's, it's actually just stringing together um, if statements. So, sir, you need someone who has, who has done the practical aspect. Well, we we're hoping someone could share. You want, you want me to write uh, what, what you're saying? I can write some here. Yeah. You want me to Okay, let to me write. do Okay. Now me amused with Java, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, that's, that's fine. Anyway, I'm looking at the time here. We don't have, uh, listen, what I, what I yeah, wanted. Let's yeah. see for, sorry? Let's like declare like like a variable equals 86 or like 90. Okay. Equals 90. Yeah, then we show a condition that if, if score range Okay. If score range equals ninety equals ninety-six. Yeah. Oh, so, if, if score range if score range equals ninety-six and yeah. equal to hundred, less or equal to hundred. Mm -hmm. So part of part of the reason why I wanted someone to implement this is because it's a combination of all of these and statements and uh, yeah. yeah okay. So I wanted to see if people were uh, have grasped the idea of using these different constructs we're talking about. But that's fine. I mean, it's, it's not meant to be. Hello, maybe I can just share briefly. Uh, although I, I haven't finished, but yes, yes. Uh, we we want you to share. I'm just going to stop sharing. All yours. Okay. Okay, just a moment.
it turns out most of what we're going to, to be doing will probably in part involve uh, you know, loops and conditions, uh, processing files, uh, but mostly trivial things really. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yeah, that, that, uh, yes we are. That looks... Uh, yeah, so I don't know if, it's, if, if, if it will work, but I was just thinking of uh, something simple. Yeah, but we wanted to return a value, not just, it, it must, it was supposed to have a return statement. Now, the, the reason I was saying that, right, is because in Python, interestingly enough, you can return multiple values. So instead of the print statement, what you, what you would have is, uh, try this, replace all the print statements with return. So for all the print statements, each of the print statements, Maybe for now, let's just uh, run that so that everybody sees the output, right? And I know it, it does exact, and there's a few logical, um, logical errors, but that's fine. Um, but but I think there's no logical errors, it's just fine looking at the specification here. But technically speaking, it pass begins at 50, right? But if you just run that, can you just run, ex you also want to evoke the function as well, so that... Uh, okay. So it's the and, the, when you're using and, it's one ampersand sign, not two. Oh, know, it's one. Yeah, our background in, in Java or something, right? <laughs> um, maybe just remove all the, uh, just remain with one single ampersand sign. Yeah, so I was trying to do the other ones, the, the C pluses, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, what, what I wanted to showcase, right? It's fine, even if it's, it's a logical error, but let's run that and see what, what is it. I'm sure the error is, the thing is wrong, but that's fine. Let's run that. Oh, sorry. You want to click in the cell three there and then run it again. Yeah, it? I've clicked. Oh, so there's so, a syntax here. Yeah, so, no, no, so the, um, so it turns out that you need to, I think you need to separate the, um, you need to put them in, so the conditions have to be separated into uh, individual, so put them in parentheses again, let's see. So if the score greater than zero should be in parentheses, I think, can you try that? If score is greater than zero? No, so instead of combining them the way you have, uh, okay, let's let's do this. Do you want to just guess exactly? Let's try that. I think that should be the problem. Oh, what have I done? There's some insert thing that is okay. Okay. Actually, you know what we can do? Let's... Uh, Maybe we comment out? Yes, exactly. Let's just remain with one condition. Is this the one? It's uh, two doc strings. So it's uh, three three single quotes or three double quotes and then three closing quotes, uh, single quotes or three closing double quotes. The indentation also, you know, you want to... So in fact, what would be best is just delete instead of commenting, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, the detention might kill us, including the same one you have. The one that has, uh, yeah, let's delete that as well. Let's run that and see. I'm wondering why the, oh, so the equal sign is actually, so you know how it's greater or equal, not equal or, or less, but it's, it's actually greater or equal. So equal sign follows the, the lesson, was that the lesson sign or something? So you start with the, you were supposed to start with the lesson sign and then the equal sign. But anyway, that should work now. Well, but obviously that won't work because of the condition, right? But um, wh why don't you say just replace everything with if true, right? So that it's true, so that it's gonna be, because what we're interested in is I want to showcase the output. So the condition should be true with uppercase T or lowercase everything. 
So just say if true and then execute that. Uppercase T. Excellent. So, right. So you see, if we were to, so but what, that's one string. But if we were wanted to return all three values, separate values, what you could have done is you could say grid, grade D, close the string. comma, the additional comma, yep, comma, and then description, fail, comma, right? Um, so what you're doing essentially is you're returning multiple values and they're going to be spit out to you um, as a tuple, right? Uh, I do this a lot and you will find yourselves doing this a lot. You've come across examples that do this a lot. Um, and how you would extract the, the part of, um, how you'd extract the, the part of the tuple that you're interested in is just by using the index, right? Zero through length minus one, essentially. Oh, so this is a tuple? Yeah, that's going to be a tuple, so you see parentheses. Um, so can I put it in a... No, no, so if you just run it the way it is, without the tuple, just, just evoke the function. We want to see the output. There you go. So now what you have is not the string you had before, but this is a turp one. So in fact, if after, after the closing parenthesis, you say square, no, after the, the invocation, you yes, open, uh, open square bracket. Okay. And then just get the first index, which is the grade, and then run that. Then you just get the grade. Uh, will it work with a zero? Yes, it will. That's the first element. Okay, let me try that. Right, so, so ideally, I mean, I just thought people might want to, to learn, right, to know this. I mean, it's quite useful. Um, uh, quite useful when you're, you're retaining multiple things here. All right, uh, but the, the, the notebook that I have oh. has, you know, don't have any. If you replace it with a one, you, you, you get the description all the way up to length minus one, which, which is three in this case, I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. By the way, if you say view, click on view in the menu item and then just toggle line numbers or shift L. It's quite useful to have the line number so that you I mean, if you're working with them. All right, so I, I don't know if people have any other thoughts. Uh, I'm looking at the time here. I don't have to suggest, I, I wanted to look at the core modules, but maybe maybe we can let people just think about this and try and see if you can play around with Python. There's a very nice book that I normally recommend to people uh, going through a crash course introduction. It's called A Byte, a Byte of Python. It's a 117-pager, very easy to follow, right? In fact, the slides are loosely centered around that particular book, the Python part, you know, not the core libraries. Um, very, very easy, right, to follow. And in fact, when you install Python, I think it's, it's, it comes bundled with the installation, at least on Linux anyway. So a byte of Python, it's called. There's a link towards the end, the appendix section, I think. Very useful resource, but also Code, Code Academy has uh, some really interesting Python uh, Python tutorials that you can work through, very interactive as well. So if you want to consolidate some of these things we just cruised through, and I do apologize, we're cruising through because ideally this shouldn't be a part of what we are doing. We just want to make sure that we get to a stage where we are understanding code. I'm hoping once we actually start working on the, the, uh, the actual Python code would have all got into a stage where we know what is happening. And, and that is actually the goal, right? The way this works is uh, within the next three weeks, uh, four weeks, we should be fine, all of us, because we're going to repeat this over and over again, just introducing different things in different packages, but the workflow is going to be the same. Um, so I, I don't know if people have any thoughts. I will share the Jupyter Notebook that has uh, a few other things that people might find useful. Um, but I'm gonna pause here and just ask if people have specific questions or concerns or something. Uh, or Maybe I can share what I've done. I yes. have a different approach. Yes, please.
Now this is the part where a, a code, uh, uh, an editor that allows you to share, like uh, edit pad or is it etherpad or something would have been useful. But we can also share screens, that's fine. Much more efficient. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, I decided to define the function. Yeah. And I use the variable mark. Yeah. Then for each, um, I used um, if else statement. Yes. I started by checking if the mark is less than 50, then that's a D, and the description is fail, and the GPA is zero, all the way up to 85%. Yeah. Then anything else should be a plus and distinction, and the GPA is five. And then I returned um, the three variables. Yeah. Of, um, yeah, you refactored the code, which is smart, actually, yes. And uh, so I'm able to check for different marks. Yeah. For second to... Yeah, that's excellent. I mean, except for the part where we are not... Uh, the, you know the usual error when you are doing unit testing, right? The bounds. Type in 1,000, let's see. There's no 1,000 percent. But I'm just joking. Anyway, this is excellent. I and mean, this, uh, this is good. This is... Okay. 1,000 will, there's no 1,000 percent, right? Let's see what happens. Logical error, but um, <laughs> that's fine. It's giving a distinction. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but this is fine. This is, uh, uh, I'm sure you probably want to play around with, uh, there are other constructs that I know people are familiar with, like uh, try and see if you can convert uh, like uh, if else statements into a switch, right? You can use switch there also. I mean, just try and see how this works elsewhere. I, I, it will help you get started, actually. Um, all right. Any other thoughts, uh, maybe concerns or comments about Python? Uh, I know it's just day one for some of you, but I assure you by the time we are getting to the third or fourth week, actually third week, uh, you will probably like Python as much as I do. Uh, very expressive. Um, and, and I want to, as people are thinking about questions here, I would like to leave you with uh, the Easter egg, right? Um, the uh, the one that I I I I I spoke about a right. Import this, right? Um, you know, it's simple. It's better than complex. If, if with with languages, more verbose languages like Java, I know they have their place in the world, but but um, but but the things that you're able to do with Python is so very a uh, few lines of code, it's, it's just amazing, right? I love uh, list comprehension, for instance. If I wanted to, if I have a list of, uh, let's say I have a list of uh, uh, 10 numbers, right? And I want to square these numbers or something, right? What I could do is I can use this comprehension, right? I could say value uh, i uh, for var i in here, I just say uh, var i, var i, right? It's comprehension, very powerful. Um, you, you get to do so much with uh, with this language. But any any thoughts? Mistake. Import this. Any comments or? Uh, no, don't know. In the face of ambiguity, refuse temptation to guess. All right, uh, now it's better than never, I suppose. Okay, thanks then. Um, I guess we'll s next week when we meet, we get to just finish off the uh, core modules. Uh, this would probably, hmm, I don't know if people want us to spend more time on this, maybe as we're explaining the data sets also, but maybe we can cruise and just cover this in maybe half the session so that we get to the uh, part where we start discussing the crisp DM model. Um, at that stage, we'll, we'll start our discussion of uh, of uh, data mining, really. And and just to mention up front that our discussion of data mining follows through the processes, right, from start to finish. So from um, business understanding all the way up to deployment, right? Okay, so I will see you uh, 
next week then. If you have any questions or if you need help with anything in the process as you're getting started with Python, please let me know. I know you're busy people, but uh, you want to just, uh, just go through this or uh, go through the one of the references that I have at the end there. There's some recommendations that I have, like a byte of Python or um, the new Boston has some, I think this is from, you know, this, this is from the new Boston, I think. Some really interesting uh, things from here. And also Code Academy, it, it, this, these things will get you started really quickly. And, and because you're not trying to perfect uh, Code Academy. You're not trying to perfect, you're not trying to be perfect at Python, this comes with time, right? By the time we're done with this course, you should be very proficient at this. But, but you want to get to a stage where you understand what's going on. And um, uh, Code Academy is uh, my recommendation. You want to go for the free ones, actually. I think there should be a free Python course somewhere. Python. You don't want to go for the paid ones. There should be free ones. I don't know what, which ones are there. No, avoid the ones in yellow, right? Although they allow you to try it out for free for about, is it a week, maybe three or something? I don't know if it's a month. But um, it should be, I thought there was one which was in pro. These guys have become stingy now, everything is pro. Okay, that's sad. I guess it's not. You know, but but uh, the new Boston, I recommend the new Boston. I, I can't uh, recommend new Boston. Uh, uh, just showcase some 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 <clears throat> some uh, some YouTube channels. If if you're the sort of person who likes uh, YouTube videos, and you want something that's going to to really um, enable you uh, enable you go through. Uh, these things at, at a much slower pace. I recommend, I, I think some of you, the new Boston, the new Boston. <clears throat> There's some really interesting uh, tutorials from here. I also recommend, uh, I think Mosh probably has, uh, has Python tutorials. Um, I remember seeing, seeing, uh, I remember seeing something in my recommendation or something. Yeah, so, I mean, these are all useful things, and this is quite recent, actually. You probably want to prioritize this from uh, programming with Mosh. I'm just gonna share this with you so that you, um, he, he, he's a really good teacher. I've, I've actually <coughs> um, gone through some of his tutorials. So I'm just gonna share uh, code with Mosh. Um, and also the new Boston, if you, if you go through his play, their playlist here, there should be Python somewhere here, I guess, I don't know. Uh, Python program, I don't know how old these are, how recent they are, but uh, this, is, this, is, um, this is much, much longer, I guess, than the code with Mosh, but it's split up into smaller manageable, I suppose, uh, the new Boston. Um, but my, the, great, the, the thing that I would recommend the most is just um, the documentation, because it turns out that your Python documentation itself has um, an, a, a detailed tutorial, right? So if you, go to, uh, if you go to the link, which is at the end here, uh, I think I linked to it here, there's a getting started guide in Python, right? If you go to python.org uh, and you go to getting started, uh, getting started, you will have access to something that I highly, highly recommend, right? If you have the time, and I think you do have the time, they walk you through the end-to-end -end process. Um, I don't know why I'm doing this. These are all in the slides, which I will share. But of course, the byte of Python as well, uh, which is linked. It's, it's available um, by Creative Commons Attribution License. Okay, then I will see you next week then. Um, and hopefully by next week, I think we'll have had a comprehensive list of uh, invited speakers, uh, or at least a partial list anyway. Thanks a lot, I'll see you next week.
Uh, so the fourth year is that I'll, uh, uh, I will ask, I'll send another link uh, to find out if you have any questions uh, about the next deadline. That's the first year undergraduate for generous. Thank you very much, colleagues. Bye. Thank you, Doc. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and I won't manage tomorrow. We have got a, a training which we were just told today that we're having a training from morning till 13 hours. Yeah, I think let's arrange for Saturday. Saturday, because in the course of the week, it's normally very tight. I've got tight schedules in the course of the week. At times, meetings just start where you didn't expect a meeting to start. Yes, so, so we will agree on Friday. Let's agree on Friday. Mm -hmm. Let's agree on Friday, what time we meet them. Mm, Friday, I'll call you before 13 hours. Yes, we'll meet, I'll meet them on Saturday, but I will confirm the exact time on Friday. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
just want to bring the point. You said that for example, it's to the point of cancer brain Thank you. 